this live, I am the Director of Marketing for Arena Net. And um, before we go ahead and get started with the panel, we're going to give you guys a rare treat. Um, we're going to play a, a suite uh, composed by Jerry Soul Ooh. of all four Gilmore's uh, main themes uh, set to video. So uh, we can dim the lights. And this is, uh, this is actually music not from the original soundtrack, but it's performed by a symphony. Uh, it's called the Play Video Game Symphony that some of you may have heard of. Yeah. And this is generally not seen outside the symphony.
Um, well, let's go ahead and uh, do the introductions for the talk. Uh, we have a wide assortment of talent here uh, today, and I'll allow them. We'll go ahead and have them introduce themselves, starting from my left. Uh, my name is Kristen Perry, and I'm a character artist. Uh, do concepts, actually build them, and uh, texture them, put them in the game. So a little bit of I'm Katie Harborough from a feature modeler that are in it. I've been there for about five years, so, uh, but I've learned the features in the game of mine. So if you have any feature questions, I'm <laughs> your person. I'm James Finney. I'm the lead designer on Guild Wars. I'm Bree Sosby. Um, my official title is game designer, but I am a writer and world builder, and my specialization is Guild Wars 2. And I'm uh, Jeff Grubb, and I am. Uh, um, I'm also a game designer and uh, was responsible for the cinematics, uh, scripts, and the continuity for uh, Nightfall and Eyes of the So, um, since Ray's gone ahead and raised the question of Guild Wars, <laughs> um, the, the title of the panel really is Three Years of Guild Wars, so kind of looking back over the history of the franchise, and that's where we're going to encourage people to direct their questions, because we really can't say a lot about Guild Wars 2 at this point. Um, that's why they put me next to James, so he can push me, push me, stop me. Um, but, um, but with the number of people here, I don't think we're going to have any shortage of questions. Uh, the way we'll handle questions is, um, before we, uh, we had the panel, we solicited, we worked with uh, Regina, our community manager, to solicit uh, questions from the uh, community. And some of these are, are kind of interesting, and, and some of them are kind of controversial. And we'll start with those first, you know, two or three of them, and then we'll open it up. Uh, we'll open up to the floor. And as many of you know, we do have, uh, you know, some tickets remaining for our party this evening. And this is one of the opportunities to obtain, obtain the last of the tickets. Um, when I call for the, the questions from the floor, could please people go in an orderly manner to the microphone, and um, the first twenty will, uh, you know, first 20 questions, we'll go ahead and we'll get, uh, we'll get you a ticket uh, to the party. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is actually one of the very few Guild Wars 2-ish questions that we can answer. Um, this was from the community, I believe, uh, from the European community. Um, are there any plans to explain what happens in the years between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2? <laughs> And uh, as many people here probably know, there are about 250 years, years between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2, and a lot can happen in uh, 250 years. Um, I am happy to announce, some, we're kind of breaking the news here at the panel, so this is you know, special for you guys. Um, we have just uh, gone into a deal with Pocket Books, a uh, three book deal. Uh, Pocket Books is a division of Simon & Schuster. And the first book in this three book deal will be uh, focused on the time between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2. Uh, at this point, that's all the news we have to report about it, but it's pretty exciting because uh, we talked to the Pocket Books guys. We, we originally met with them at Comic Con and they were really excited about um, you know, the lore and our world. And we think it's just great that we've been able to you know, enter into a partnership with them. So that's the. Uh, that's the answer to that question. You will get you will get lots of information about the time between Guild Wars One and Guild Wars Two, and one of the main ways will be um, through the first book in the series. So I'm going to open this up to the next question up to the rest of the panel. Um, what was the thing that players did in the game that surprised you the most? Vinny, why don't we start with Vinny? Okay. Well, I, I think really it's just the amount that people have played. <laughs> you know, we, we look at the size of the game that we made, and then, uh, you know, we look at all the, the sort of play stats and what people are doing, and the number of you guys that have played more than 5,000 hours, the number that have played more than 10,000 hours, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's really impressive. And uh, we're, you know, trying sometimes successfully, sometimes with some growing pains, to try to make a game that, um, is worthy of that level of attention. You know, I was struck when uh, when the video was playing, if I can ramble on here for just a sec, uh, by, uh, you know, when, when game developers, when we get to see something like that, it brings back a lot of a lot of memories, not just of the game, but also the development process. You know, these are years of our lives where uh, people are getting married, having kids, loved ones pass away, new relationships are formed, people break up, all kinds of, you know, 
uh, things go on. And we didn't know when we started Guild Wars just how much, not just for us, but also for the players, they were going to choose to live in the game. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's been a, a big lesson for us moving forward. One of the things that uh, impressed me was the amount of lore that they invest in, they check out, and uh, and discuss. I lurk on the lore forums. I pay attention to what, what people are talking about. And what intrigues me is how much they'll key in on some piece that we thought was interesting or a sidelight or a little bit of a little grace note, a little bit of nuance, and theories will come out, and ideas and concepts, and I, and I love to see these, because it's basically, they're helping grow the game, they're helping create the mythos underneath it. Uh, one of my favorites was uh, in Nightfall, when you have a choice between the two acolytes, and there was long discussions on, on some of the uh, forums about which acolyte is better, better based on their personality, as opposed to their uh, profession, and that, that impressed me. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Um, if you could change one thing in Guild Wars, what would that be? Okay, so um, originally I came in halfway through factions. That was my first. Uh, I mean, I was a player. Don't worry, I played through the prophecies <laughs> when I came into factions. Um, and I designed a lot of the Kursik armor, and or sorry, the Kursik NPCs. And um, they they uh, let me uh, test out on some player character armor. So I was responsible for the uh, assassin Zodic. Is that the one with the little spikes? I think the name for it. Um, all the little, it looks like a walking pin cushion, right? Okay. Looks, yeah, I thought it looked decent on the female, but the male version of that had some straps on the side. Didn't translate so well on that one, did it? <laughs> so, this might not be the groundbreaking thing like everybody was whispering, jumping, but the problem is, is once you actually have somebody um, uh, earn that armor, you can't go in and change the armor that they spent so many hours doing things, so we've got all this skin showing on the guys, and um, if I could do that over, <laughs> handle that up. <laughs> I, I think I wish I could have made more pets for players. <laughs> I, I really like pets in the <laughs> <laughs> I think it was actually really heroic in terms of getting a lot of those things in. Um, but we, we weren't always able to budget as much time for that stuff as we uh, Maybe should have, and a lot of times she she <laughs> she would work extra hours in order to create a lot of those bets, and a lot a lot of the uh, unusual ones were just fun things she wanted to do. without uh, turning this into a litany of, of little things. Um, I think I'd try to make sure that uh, all the titles, all of that kind of stuff, match the content in terms of scope. There, there are some, and uh, fortunately I think we're going to be able to fix some of that stuff moving forward, where, you know, Kurzik title, for example, uh, the amount of time it would take to, to get that has nothing to do with the amount of gameplay that's associated with it. So, uh, you know, we definitely fix that, and I think Kind of in conjunction with that, it's a big thing that we're, we're able to address now. Would have had a, a dedicated live team on the, on the game sooner. Okay. Now, I know it's absolutely taboo to rewrite lore, but if you could rewrite lore, was there anything you guys would... Uh, oh, Jim, yeah, go ahead. Um, I would have I redeemed Abaddon. That was one of the things when we were originally doing the story for Nightfall. We talked about, you know, will Abaddon be uh, ultimately destroyed, or will we find a way to redeem him and to bring him back? And we examined it, we turned it over, and saw how it would go over in gameplay, and came back to it again and again, and we decided at the end we had to, had to kill him. But uh, given another, uh, another chance and a different set of resources, I think I would have gone for redemption. Mine isn't lore based, but I would have uh, had a magic wand and no names. Um, I would have redone some of the faction's voice acting. <laughs>
we've, I think we've filled enough questions from the community. Um, if you would like to go ahead and ask a question, uh, please approach the mic. Uh, when you're done, you can come up here and I will give you a ticket. We've got about 20 of them. Uh, we'll basically give the first 10 two tickets uh, so that you, know, you can bring a friend to the party. There's no, no good going to parties if you don't have friends. in the uh, game itself. And Karen Dorwan, who is also Kalindra, Kalindri, or li uh, Librarian Kalindri, there she is right there, standing up. In the game she was looking for, she was working on the Book of, the, book of Swine, and she was looking on stuff on pigs. <laughs> and this morning she came, came up to me and she gave me this beautiful homemade book, which is all of the, uh, uh, all the pigs of Guild Wars, <laughs> including the Celestial Pig and Oink. <laughs> and I'm going to take it back to back to the company and we're going to put it in our trophy case. Thank you, thank you very much. First question. All right, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I noticed you guys had a Steam group playing, playing some Team Fortress. I heard also heard a rumor, I don't know if this is true, some of you playing WoW. Um, I just wondered what other games you play and how that influenced Guild Wars 1 and how it might influence Guild Wars, Guild Wars 2. I'm a big COH fan. <laughs> <laughs> 45, uh, veteran, thank you. Um, and uh, I finally got my, my scrapper to 50 recently. And um, even though I, I'm not an altaholic, I do love going through the game and I do love um, being able to solo and feel like I'm the one that's playing and playing through all these missions and being the success and being this hero. Um, I also like the costume shop. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I would have to say, you know, the, the flexibility of the costume options, um, you know, whether something is my favorite or something that I don't think work or anything that's together, you know, just to be able to, to have those kind of options or just feel like a fan and feel like a player and be able to deck out my avatar is really cool. And uh, then the other thing, like I said, um, to be able to feel that is personalized to me because that's why I play games. I don't, I'm, I'm not the type that escapes to try to be somebody else. I want to feel like I'm doing these really, really cool things. And so I would say that. Uh, I tend to play uh, not a lot of online games outside of Guild Wars, honestly. Uh, I'm in love with my Nintendo DS. And if it's a weird Japanese game that I can't read, it's like my favorite thing. <laughs> Oh, and then maybe my favorite city, uh, series ever. You're not going to answer, Chris? Yeah, Chris. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I play WoW. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, but in fact, it's kind of funny because when I want to go interview, um, when I want to go interview an interview, we're like, yeah, we really, for, we don't want a marketer who doesn't understand games or doesn't live, you know, passionately live the gamer lifestyle. And uh, they looked at my resume. featured in an MSNBC piece, so every now and then it, it resurfaces on the air or, you know, you can find links on it online and, and uh, see Chris and his wife Sarah Thanks. talking about WoW. Okay. Uh, really trying to play uh, uh, a lot of everything, but uh, Team Fortress 2 is, is part, of, part of what's going on these days. I'd say uh, recent games that really uh, impressed me, so not all of super recent, but that, you know, I'll bring into the office and, and say, you know, hey, check this out, uh, Peggle, <laughs> uh, all, the, all the Phoenix Wright games, um, yeah, Team Fortress, and, and you know, uh, you, every, every MMO has things that, 
you learn from the good and the bad things to steal. Uh, so everyone that comes out, we get into and play for a while, some a little longer than others. I play a tremendous amount of games. I'm probably addicted to. I'm addicted to computer gaming. Um, I, I've played well through raids. I've played um, Age of Conan not for very long. Um, uh, I'd like to say I've played Soul Calibur, but really I've probably spent about 26 hours building different characters and never played them. Same with City of Heroes, which I have played all the way up, but I, I can't help it. I, I build characters on there all the time because it's so much fun. Um, my, my favorite game is, is um, very obscure. It's uh, a game that was on the PS2, it was Japanese, and it was the sticky ball game. And all you had was a little ball, and you rolled the ball, and it was sticky things and pick them up. And you started with like paper, yeah. you, started, you started with the paper clips and you ended up with worlds. Yeah, it's a great game. I haven't figured out how to get the sticky ball game into Go Wars 2. <laughs> you, you know, in, in, uh, Roller Beatles. in Guild Wars 1, that, that's how that happened. We were, uh, I, yeah, I came in, you know, one uh, Monday and was just, we can do it. I think we can, we can, we can do like a Katamari level. Instead of <laughs> how we could do all this stuff. And we had to sort of scale back uh, how ambitious what we were trying to do was. And uh, Roller Beetle racing came out of that. <laughs> Massively multiplayer is a great place to see heroes. I've been a WoW fan. Uh, my big problem with WoW is I've got like characters on 17 servers because <laughs> I tend to be a social gamer in that I'm playing with literally people I know and they say, oh, we're all going over to this server and we're going to set up so I create a first level character and I go along for a while and they all get ahead of me and then okay, things we never, never talk again. And then another group of friends say, oh, we're going to be over here playing. And I get over there and we, we do the, repeat the process. So I've got like... Uh, 20 characters scattered all over the place as well as, well as that. In uh, non MMOs, one of the big fan. I'm a big fan of uh, Lego Star Wars because that is, that is a game that my wife and I, well, my wife who's not a computer gamer, will play. And I will come home and she is basically trying to find the last mini can on the level and reach it. And you know, and, and we we have to play for a while, so we have to figure out what we can do. Next question. This uh, might be a better question for uh, Isaiah or Izzy, uh, but um, you guys had a great skill system going for the longest time, and then recently you guys decided to change it, split it off into this different set of PVE and PVP skills that um, sometimes are wildly different, sometimes just minor differences. What what inspired the what what brought about the decision to split them apart like that? Okay, well that, that's actually my decision, so oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically, anything you dislike in the game is, is from me. <laughs> yeah, uh, sometimes they call me the destroyer of fun at the office. Uh, really, you know, we had to accept that the pacing in uh, PvP combat and PvE combat was so fundamentally different that uh, in order to make balanced decisions that worked for one format, uh, we were making players in the other format suffer. And uh, there just came a point where I said, you know, you're never going to nerf a PvE skill again for PvP reasons, and we're going to find a way to do that. We talked through a lot of different uh, possible solutions, and uh, that was the most expedient one. You know, we look at ideally how we could have handled uh, things, or um, you know, having the split, and especially in the cases. And there, you know, to be fair, there aren't very many cases where the functionality is radically different. But, uh, you know, we don't really want to have uh, the game have that, but it's an existing game. There are a lot of people out there playing. What we'd like to do is make decisions that don't decrease people's fun, but instead increase people's fun. That's certainly what we've been trying to do lately. And uh, I know there are critiques here and there about, uh, you know, in principle, what we've done. But I guess the question is, are the skills better today on balance than they were two months ago or three months ago? I think the answer is pretty obvious. Thanks. This question is uh, targeted at Ms. Hargrove in particular. I was wondering, when designing creatures, where do you draw your influences from, and how many iterations do they go through before they get to their final design? So, I've only concepted a limited number of creatures for Guild Wars specifically, but, um, like, 
character and creature design is like mostly comes from real animals, like studying animal anatomy and just watching the Discovery Channel a little too much. Um, and then just being inspired by the artists around me. Uh, like growing up, Disney was enormous and I think it shows in my work all the time. And then things like, you know, Jim Henson's work, The Dark Crystal, things like that. And actually, like, uh, what I've been trying to do recently is actually get better at my humans. And there's a Guild Wars fan whose online is Makani, and she's like a huge inspiration to me. And it's kind of weird because I'm like, oh, I love your art. And she's like, I like your art. It's kind of funny. But it's mostly animal anatomy and just, you know, finding other people's styles and trying to learn from what they do right and what they do not as well, and then trying to constantly improve. And it's it's an ongoing battle. And you're never you're never ever happy, but you just Hope other people enjoy it. Thanks. So I was, uh, I know, I like the CGI rendered, uh, pre-rendered cinematics that was for Guild Wars Prophecy and Guild Wars Factions. But I noticed that Guild Wars Nightfall and Guild Wars Eye of the North both don't have uh, pre-rendered CGI cinematics. I was wondering uh, why that is and if you guys would have, like, go back and maybe make it for them, or make it for Guild Wars 2. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, those sorts of things are basically business and marketing decisions, even though Chris is letting me answer this. Uh, they, <laughs> they, uh, they cost a lot of money to make, and uh, there's a lot of advanced planning, especially you look at the, uh, how insanely tight our schedules were to release uh, a lot of the Guild Wars campaigns. Um, it wasn't always practical for us to do that. Yeah, in the case of Nightfall, I believe that the consideration was more scheduling than, um, than monetary. And for Gwen, it's just a question of, you know, just so you know, these, these, these kind of pre-rendered CGI videos, uh, we don't have an in-house shop that does it. We have to like outsource it to, you know, either in Korea or somebody uh, in North America. And they can run anywhere between, uh, you know, close to half a million dollars. I mean, yeah, half a million dollars. And you go, wow, would I rather spend that on an ad campaign or like more development resources? You, you have to make the hard choices, especially on expansion. Um, as to whether we would consider them uh, for Guild Wars 2, um, I would say we would definitely consider them. <laughs> All right, first specifically PVP related question of the day, which would probably be better for Isaiah, uh, Izzy, but I'll ask you. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty simple. Uh, the, the guy asked earlier the, uh, whether or not or why you broke the skills apart. And for a PvE player, it doesn't make sense. As a PvP player, it makes perfect sense. The issue is, well, my question basically is, when Prophecies first came out, the skills were relatively balanced. The word Build Wars didn't particularly exist. Uh, you started bringing in teleports, you started bringing in dervishes, you could bring enchantments constantly, things, skills like that and uh, Guild Wars became more substantial. Uh, indirectly related to Guild Wars 2, do you plan on doing anything to adjust the Build Wars factor from this point forward for Guild Wars 1 or Guild Wars 2? And do you think it's an issue or a strength of the game? Okay. Um, quick answer to start, it's definitely an issue. And I think if you look um, carefully at the trend in skill balance choices over the course of, say, the last year, uh, you'll see uh, generally an attempt to de-emphasize specific counters to uh, take skills that are um, specialized and generalize them and uh, uh, to move the game as much as possible away from a build war sort of effect. I do think it's, uh, you know, I know that there are a lot of critiques of uh, uh, some of the later professions and a lot of things that were introduced into the game over time uh, by a segment of the, the PvP play, player base, but um, it's not, uh, uh, I just lost my train of thought, sorry, what I was going to say earlier is that I don't know that it's fair to say that um, the Build Wars concept didn't, you know, that, that term didn't exist. Even when we were in beta, people were throwing that around, right? It's, it's always been a delicate balance with the game. Um, you know, I'm not going to claim that the, the play balance is perfect, although uh, I think uh, we've done a pretty decent job. The level of complexity 
in uh, Play Balance in Guild Wars uh, is really extreme compared to other games. You know, a lot of people on the team, myself included, worked on a lot of uh, competitive games and had to deal with complex Play Balance before. Uh, Guild Wars blows other games away in terms of the, the uh, complexity of the problems that we deal with. And so, uh, you know, we're doing the best that we can, we make adjustments uh, when it seems like adjustments need to be made. Thank you. So first I want to say that I think Guild Wars has done an awful lot of things right, especially compared to some of the other games I've seen. I want to say thank you all very much for that. I really appreciate it. It makes the gameplay wonderful. <laughs> Particularly I wanted to call out, uh, I've never felt like I had to grind anyway, anywhere through any one of the four uh, modules. And when you brought on uh, the voice of the brain to play Beck, that was wonderful. <laughs> that voice acting really worked well, really enhanced the game. Thank you for that. I do want to make one feature request. Um, I'm just that kind of guy. Okay. So one thing I found out when we introduced Nightfall is the concept of heroes, and they kept saying, you never fight alone. Well, suddenly I found I was actually fighting alone. It was just me, me and a bunch of heroes, because the heroes were so good, I didn't really need other people. So the feature request is, as you're thinking about Guild Wars 2, I'd like you to reintroduce some of the needing other people aspects to it. So it's nice to be able to go alone, but there are also times when it's nice to have to work with other people. Okay. Can, we, <laughs> can I talk, to, talk about that at all? I mean, yes, definitely. Like, Is there stuff you said already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think fundamentally uh, you'll have a very different experience in Guild Wars 2 as far as uh, choosing to play with or not play with other people because of the, the persistent nature of the you know, sort of explorable world. And so you don't have to make this hard binary choice before you go into an explorable, who am I bringing along or who am I not? You have that opportunity for sort of casually meeting up with other people and joining them or going off on your own. Okay, thanks. Um, I was wondering if there would be any further exploration or development of the city of war. Well, uh, in terms of what we might or might not do in Guild Wars 2, no comment. <laughs> in terms of uh, Guild Wars 1, you know, we're, we're uh, uh, always looking at what we can and can't do on the, on the live team. Uh, there's certainly a lot of stuff that we have in mind or might be a little big for, for Lindsay to take on. Yeah. Thank you. All right, um, a lot of people, or the people I play with, see that the end game of Guild Wars is PvP. Did you ever plan on having an end game? And if so, are you happy that you chose PvP instead of PvE? Well, I think it's clear that uh, when you look at the range of players, not everyone wants to do that. Not everyone uh, takes that as their end game. Uh, certainly at the very genesis of uh, Guild Wars, that was the thinking. And then uh, we've made adjustments since then. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, not always 100% successfully. So. Yeah, but I think you guys made the PvP endgame amazing because really, even though I beat all the campaigns about like twice mm -hmm. each, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> the PvP keeps me coming back and the fact that there's no monthly fees, I have it installed at all times, so whenever, that's why I still come back to it three years later. Awesome. Thank I mean, you. you know, those were those are certainly all the things that we were looking to be able to do, and so <coughs> I'm glad that that's working for you. All right, thank you. Hi. Being a concept art junkie that I am, uh, I have to ask, uh, do the concept artists do drawings for every piece of weapon, armor, objects, or do the 3D artists building them get to have much fun every now and then and build something on their own? And secondly, will, there, will we be seeing an Art of Guild Wars book? You guys want to talk about the artist process? Um, well, uh, for the first part of that question, um, yeah, everything is concepted. Every single thing is, is concepted, every, every weapon and so forth. But in, um, in many of the departments, uh, I would, or at least especially in the character department, um, anybody who concepts their work can build it. So, uh, I mean, you're not guaranteed to build it. You can pick your favorites, of course. Sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, any time that uh, that I I I had built those uh, those Gwen outfits, that uh, I concepted them. You know, I gave her the, the new haircut and little barrette and everything. I was looking forward to doing that little barrette. So I, you know, I, I got to build the the model as well. But everybody is is a pretty much a, a jack of all trades in that. Um, other departments work a little bit differently. But there there is a there's hope to be able to build anything you want. 
Uh, a lot of the artists do a lot of artwork outside of work. Um, there's the uh, unofficial Arenas Art Arena Net Art Blog, uh, Sketchwitch.com, and it has a bunch of us post work to that place. And that's not work related for the most part. It's just things we do outside. Uh, there's a lot of um, people who are into fine oil painting, like you have nude figures and things like that. It's very very good. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit more on that in terms of the. Um, how much stuff is concepted, everything, bushes, the grass, what the, what the uh, palette is like in a particular area. They, they do a ton of stuff and, uh, and you know, obviously really high quality. It's, it's amazing. I've never seen a team that has so many incredible concept artists. Are you allowed to say how many, roughly how many concept artists you have on staff working on Guild Wars 2? Oh, now we're going to have to count them. Matt, how many guys are there? Just rough. <laughs> are we talking 50, 60, 70? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> 10, 10? No, no. Well, I mean, like the, the, the core concept team's like five guys. No. Oh, yeah. Busy, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The uh, character is probably another, oh uh, gosh, technically about eight people would be concepting and building mm -hmm. at the same time, so. Yeah. But if you ever visit our offices, I mean, the pure volume of concept art that is created is mind boggling. It's mm -hmm. all over the walls. And uh, I, I like that. You can correct me if, if I'm wrong on this. Uh, that we had six of our artists who were in the Spectrum collection for science fiction and fantasy art last year. And uh, our lead co lead concept artist, uh, Daniel Dossier, uh, they took the gold and the silver in concept art. So we've got we've got an all star squadron. Yep. So. We see a book. Hi. Book. You know, I don't know. We're Randy. What do you think? Can we get to see a book? I put you on the spot here. We're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Now, Daniel, Daniel Dochu is very close to the guys who uh, Ballistic Press. They, they do a lot of the fantasy art, like really high quality stuff. And we'd love. I mean, there's no, no ink, nothing deal, no deal, no discussion. But we really would love to work with a publisher like that if we were going to do something like that. One of my favorite pop culture references is Drake's on the Plane, which I think the banana scythe is a <laughs> quest reward for. I was wondering what everyone's favorite pop culture reference was. Oh, I don't even know. You know, the, the fact that for great justice is actually even a commonly used skill <laughs> still cracks me up. What was the Asura skill? That one was awesome. Oh, Smooth Criminal? Smooth Criminal. <laughs> Thanks. This is going to be probably our last. Well, we might be able to get two questions in, but this is uh, this is our last ticket. So go ahead. Um, Two-part question: uh, What is the hardest thing you've had to overcome while making Guild Wars, and what's with the statue of Glint in the Crystal Crystal Desert? Who feels you guys want to tackle any of the lore stuff? I have no comment on the, uh, I, on the, I, the crystal I can statue. neither confirm nor deny that the statue of Glint in the Crystal Desert is in any way important or could possibly be involved in anything that might happen someday. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done, <Dave. laughs> And you didn't even mention Guild Wars. You didn't even mention Guild Wars 2. Yeah. You Good were work. ready to punch yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the girl with Orr. I'm jumping up and... Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, uh, sure, everybody has, has their own horror stories, which they may or may not want to share, but uh, the, uh, the Guild Wars team is up over 100 people at this point, and, you know, none of them are, are just there to, you know, kind of be there 9 to 5. They're, they're all uh, passionate and creative people, and trying to take a team of um, that many creative people who all have their own very different ideas about things, and... Uh, uh, keep us moving in the same direction. Uh, it's the same difficult challenge every day. <laughs> I'll just say something from a marketing perspective that um, I think the, the biggest challenge I deal with, that I deal with for Guild Wars and will continue to do for Guild Wars 2, is the overwhelming perception by people who don't play Guild Wars that it is a PvP only game. And you'd be surprised, I mean, maybe some of you wouldn't be surprised, but you'd be surprised, like, people who don't really know Guild Wars think all it is is PvP. And I think most people in this room know that it's way more than that. And um, that it turns out that the majority of people who continue to play 
you know, month after month are playing, you know, in a, in a PVE level. And so, uh, you know, that's going to be a challenge, I think, for us. The only things that have been uh, hard for me have been technical limitations, generally, or um, strange ways I've had to build things. Like, when you talk, like, some of the materials we use, you have to use multiple UV sets on one creature, and they all have to be, like, completely different. Like, you can't take the same set on each side, and so it's just, like, strange technical limitations or, you know, you'll get a bug and you won't know, you won't have any clue why it's doing what it does and five days later you're like, oh, that's what it was. And I, I can't think of anything specific, but it, it's always something just odd it pops up. Um, probably the biggest thing for me is the balance between um, art and diable area. <laughs> uh, coming up with a design that uh, that does have the flexibility to be able to look good when it's you shifted into other dyes. I mean, it 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 does. I mean, you have to have enough area so that you know that that special black dye that you spent how many platinum trying to earn. You know, it doesn't just do a button <laughs> or something. You know, and people would get really upset about that. So I would have to say being able to to design something that's really cool and intricate, but still have enough big, broad areas for diable. <laughs> All right, we have time for one more question. Thank you. Yeah. Surprised nobody was saying their names or who they're, what guilds they're from or whatnot. <laughs> so great to see you guys, uh, fans of the game and whatnot. Uh, hey, I'm Joe. Joe Hostile from Rebel Rising <laughs> RAR. If anybody wants to come meet me, I'd be happy to talk to y'all. Uh, it's, it's really good to see you guys in, in live for the first time, it's really cool. GVG question, uh, uh, tournaments and whatnot, community thing. Um, uh, we put on the Rebel, the, the RAR uh, Cup and stuff. We did the Guru Challenge and whatnot. I was wondering if there was going to be more support for that, uh, looking back on the last three years and, and upcoming for those kind of external events. To, I mean, the PvP is ingenious, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of things going on outside of ArenaNet putting on stuff. And I was wondering if there's any way we could uh, push and grow that in the future. Well, obviously, I can't commit to anything uh, specific, but I will say that we thought that those those events were awesome, and we Thank thought you. it was great that those happened, and uh, uh, think it would be great for the game to have more of that kind of thing. So we'll see what that can translate to. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. Well. I want to thank everyone um, for fill basically filling the room. And uh, if you have not stopped by the booth, uh, please do so. We've got community games, we've got tournaments, and we're selling third anniversary Guild Wars t-shirts. And my understanding is that they are the hot seller at the NC Soft booth. So, <laughs> yep. And the party opens at six o'clock. Yeah. And after nine. Yeah. And after nine o'clock, GameWorks opens to everybody. Okay. Thank you.